Welcome to Adventures in Accessibility, a podcast that explores the far reaches of disability, access, and inclusion with your host, Emily Schumann. Welcome back, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Today's guest is Foster Anderson. Foster's journey took a dramatic turn at 17 during the summer between his junior and senior years of high school. An active and athletic young man, he was riding his motorcycle through the woods of upstate New York when a severe accident left him in a two-week coma. He recalls a near-death out-of-body experience when his heart stopped for six seconds. Despite his quadriplegia, Foster's determination to live fully never wavered. Seven months after the accident, he left the hospital with a clear goal. I wanted to get outdoors again. I wanted to get unstuck. Though unable to walk, he went on to bungee jump out of a hot air balloon, scuba dive, surf, chair ski, sail, and follow the Grateful Dead, invent a frisbee for quadriplegics, attend engineering school, and drive across the country in his adaptive van. As an inventor and innovator, Foster's adventures were just beginning in ways he never imagined. His mission became sharing this spirit with others in the disability community. In 1985, he co-founded Shared Adventures with a sit-ski program in Rochester, New York. For over 30 years, Foster has been running the program in Santa Cruz, inspiring countless others to embrace life after challenge. Hi, Foster. Thanks so much for being on our podcast. We're really excited to be talking to you today. And it feels so great to be here now. I really appreciate you getting a hold of me and wanting to do this. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your story and how you got injured and, you know, how you subsequently adjusted to living with a spinal cord injury. Yeah, it's a very unique story, I believe. And everybody has unique stories. But when I was growing up, it was in upstate New York. Right now I'm 63. So the life that I lived was in a rural area where I was able to play a lot in the woods and creeks and had an Ozzy and Harriet family that really loved me a lot. And I had a motorcycle that I was riding. Um, I love that thing for my independence. So I was going down the tracks to take some time off before I went to dinner that night. And Um, I hit a log on my motorcycle, so it partially severed my spinal cord, the fifth and sixth cervical vertebrae, and I was in the back tracks, nobody around, and woke up in the hospital with 35 pounds of traction bolted to my head, a respirator hooked up my throat, I was in a coma, and didn't know who I was, where I was, and it was pretty devastating. At age 17. Yeah. In between my junior and senior in high school. So that's what happened. And I started my second life trying to figure out who I was and where I was. So here I am now living a life using a wheelchair. And I used a manual chair for the longest time, seven years afterwards. But I had to, you know, finish my high school degree, which I did. And I got taught English and health. So, you know, with English, I was able to figure out in words, how I can convey myself, how, what happened to my body. So as time went on, you know, went on to college, it was, wasn't for my family and friends. I, I didn't know I wouldn't be here where I am today. So it's a devastating thing that happened, but for me, surviving it and being able to continue on going to college and then figure out the best adaptive way I can live. And, you know, if it wasn't for my mom and dad and my brother, my sisters, you know, they were able to help me with my transition. Friends that were in the hospital were going into nursing homes and I was going home to a home that was all converted. You know, dad helped me have a weight system in the closet. He was, you know, a desk where I could be the most independent I could be. And I think, um, you know, having that support was the best thing I could have. But I also felt here are people in nursing homes now that couldn't, you know, have a life 
So I really needed to get them out to my place. And that's what started my, you know, celebrating my anniversaries every year. And my girlfriend time was like, why do you want to celebrate? <laughs> you know, it's something that totally happened to you that that is devastating. But I would push my own chair. I invented a frisbee you could throw with your thumbs and and eventually um, got a patent on it and then started selling them all over the United States, which was very unique. And then I was pushing myself through college and was didn't know what I wanted to do, but I ended up um, doing liberal arts and then mechanical engineering or business and mechanical engineering. And I was going to follow my dad's footsteps. So that he was an architect, but I couldn't do architecture. So when the computer came around, I could start drawing on the computer. And um, so that, you know, led to a whole new level of independence and a little carrot on the end of the stick, per se, to be able to, um, you know, learn. And then my dad was always wanting me to, you know, get out. And I always wanted to get out, you know, and really enjoy the outdoors. So I'd push myself up into the park every day. Um, that help me, you know, with exercise and just being outside. And then with just going to um, this new program where you could do a, a college level class and, and a learning skills class at Albany State University. And that was my first time out of the house. So that, my life fell apart. I ended up going to a rehab center, spending oh. two months there, coming back a whole new person, being able to learn how to drive a van. But it couldn't take me until like another three more years to finally get a vehicle and then um, be able to drive myself. So, you know, like so much independence before my accident and then having nothing and now learning all these things on my own because there really wasn't a lot of people back then that were wheelchair users mm -hmm. so I had to create my own reality <laughs> and, you know from how am I going to get something out of a toaster oven you know so I had my dad create this foam padded handle um super spat that I called it and then I was able to create um something you put my albums on so I could listen to music. So those things, you know, really helped. I created a, uh, or built a, um, a lift to get me in and out of the pool. So that, you know, I'm swimming again. Right. So it sounds like you invented a few things for adaptive, you know, tools for yourself. Right. Which helped me, which helped other people, which, and then also inviting the people that, went into nursing homes to my house to have a barbecue on my anniversary, you know, and then, so getting them together and meeting people at college. And I followed the Grateful Dead. My first Grateful Dead show was 1977. I broke my neck in 1978. That was my first time to see them in the hospital. I just said like two hours in order to go to the show. I couldn't even sit up for a half an hour. So that was my goal. I was in the hospital for seven months. And um, a long time to be there. And, you know, there's four, three other spinal cord injuries there that have really influenced me to do other things. So I had a lot of influence from other spinal cord injuries, but I really had to learn things on my own. And I did a lot of activism too. Like when I was, went to a Joni Mitchell show and they just created a new performing arts center and there is no disabled seating. And it's like, you know, call the newspaper, call the independent living center, mm -hmm. change it. So there's those things. And then when I went on to engineering school, I 
ran into somebody that if I want to do sit skiing, you know, I was like skiing again. I'm mm -hmm. like, love to. So he ended up um, telling me about Colorado Occasional Center for the Handicap and that there's sit skis and then we can write a grant from Easter Seals and then we'll go skiing at Swain, which is a mountain that I used to ski at all the time. So I got my dad's trailer down there. He said, let's call this Shared Adventures. And I'm like, great. So I was down there skiing with, you know, other spinal cord injuries. So that opened up a whole new, you know, aspect to my life because I'm kind of like an adrenaline junkie with wanting to have that speed of the motorcycle or go skiing down the mountain, um, do something different. I was very active and creative. So I'm still that way now. <laughs> and you didn't have to give that up. I didn't have to give that up. I'm very driven to accomplish something. And when I put my mind to it, um, I like to finish it. So I have to look back now. Here I am, 63. I was 17. Mm -hmm. And I finished high school with my class, went on to college, got a van on the road, followed the Grateful Dead for 20 years. Ended up in California, where I am now. I'm in Santa Cruz now. Starting Shared Adventures there. Post. And then um, fell in love with a girl. You know, other, <laughs> you know, she lived in Santa Barbara. <laughs> and so we flew up to, well, she lived in Santa Barbara. You know, we flew up to Grateful Dead in Red Rocks, Colorado. But it's those things, you know, carrots on the other side, people wanting to like, hey, why don't you do it? And having somebody to do it with, it was so meaningful to me. And Ken Winchester, who suggested going sit skiing, um, said, well, why don't you start it on the East Coast when you go there, or West Coast when you go there? And I'm, I'm like, well, I just finished 10 years of engineering school. I got to study in my field of study. When I ended up in Berkeley, where I ended up meeting Ed Roberts from the Independent Living Movement, living on Telegraph Avenue, which is the most progressive independent living movement that you can imagine, and getting together with Center for Independent Living there, um, Berkeley Disabled Student Program that got me a um, care provider because that's why one reason I moved out to California was for the health care. So I get there and Walter was waiting for me. So um, we instantly connected. Um, he became my care provider. The person I drove out with, you know, she was with her family. And I started my third life out in California being independent on my own. But, you know, I give my mom and my dad a lot of credit for helping me for 10 years after my accident. Help me get up in the morning, in the bed at night, coming home after a night of music, you know, <laughs> helping me in the bed. But I needed that recreation. I needed that outlet to have fun and be like everybody else. Because a lot of people with spinal cord injuries or disabilities, that I feel like they don't really, we don't fit in society or we're not treated the same. Mm. So I did not want to feel that way. And this was was my way to be who I am, you know, so I, I didn't take no for an answer. So living in Berkeley and then moving to Oakland, getting, getting politically active in the Bay Area, um, working with Bay Area Outreach and Recreation Program, 
and we were going river rafting and skiing up in Lake Tahoe. It was amazing um, sailing in San Francisco. I was just getting into all these things that you don't usually do on the East Coast because it's more family oriented and the topography isn't as stimulating as California is. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I mean, I could keep going on and on. <laughs> so, well, you 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 gave us all the background about kind of how you came up with Shared Adventures and what, what inspired you to um, start the organization. But tell us a little bit more about what the organization does as it exists today. So Shared Adventures on the West Coast, um, after I moved down to Santa Cruz, after the earthquake, uh, I was at Cabrillo College starting my third degree in computer graphics drafting. Terry Sims from, he was a pro surfer, came in to adapt a PE program and asked if anybody wanted to go surfing. So, of course, I raised my hand and then a bunch of other people did. So, here we are, you know, going down 38th Avenue stairwell, surfing, and then I celebrate my anniversary, like I was telling you. And so let's go to Powell's Beach, where they have a beach chair, and take a bunch of people out surfing there. So that was the beginning of Shared Adventures in 1992. And then I had to keep doing other activities like kayaking, and then hiking in the woods. And so we integrated those the next year, kayaking. Mm-hmm. And then um, added a few more people and getting plywood down on the beach. And then we have, um, I said, well, I want to become a nonprofit. So I started networking with the city and looking for a board of directors. So now Shared Adventures is in its 32nd year, and we have activities five days a week, major events like Day on the Beach every year that take people out kayaking, outward your canoeing, scuba diving. We lay down over 200 sheets of plywood. We give away free food from the Sai Baba. We have music throughout the whole day. We have 13 beach wheelchairs. We've had over a thousand people. So it's really grown with um, participants, with volunteers, with my dedicated board of directors that I could not thank them enough to keep my vision alive and really increasing the quality of life for everyone. Even volunteers come back every year and they, they get they get more out of it than the participants pittings do. Right. So I feel like I really kind of made myself available to fill a void that makes me satisfied to the point I keep I keep going and going and finding more things that people want to do or there's you know the, you know, beach wheelchair, the technology. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's get the state parks to have them all. Let's get have more ramps on the beach. So, you know, I've been working with my board chair, Steve Miller, who's been with me since 1997. And um, Becky Gumbel, and she's my program director. So, and she's been helping implement all these activities that we do now. And um, so, I mean, I can list a few things that we do, um, like kayaking, sailing, bingo, um, adaptive fitness. We have swimming at Simpkins Pool Center. We have gardening strolls with Alex, which I'm going to go on tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Excited out. And we have a Challenger Little League, which is um, all, all the kids or people can 
participate and they hit the ball and everyone gets a home run, everyone gets a jersey, everyone gets food afterward, and they team up with a group of other little leaguers that um, get involved um, and they get to learn <laughs> what it's like. And we have four day, three nights at Camp Adventures where there's a swimming pool, a zip line, outdoor climbing wall, um, art classes or you know, arts and crafts, um, talent night. All the food is tailored to what you what your needs are. And it's $50 for four days, three nights. Wow. And the Taylor Foundation um, gives us money to put it on. So you can't even live for $50 on a no. day, like <laughs> four days and have all those things available to you. So it's really cool. Like here it is 32 years later and people are coming to me like, oh, you remember me? And, you know, or you don't remember me, but I was four years old and now I'm 27 and I'm teaching class at Bayview Elementary School, and I want you to teach at my class. Wow. Where I do, like, show and tell. Yeah. And I, and I bring my inventions, my quad B, my super spat, and I show them my chair, which tilts back, and all the buttons are really fascinated, and and then my adaptive van, and they all get in it, and push buttons, and so it's really, it's fun. It's like, you know, I enjoy life. And it's fun to have fun. Yeah, that's wonderful. Your organization does so much and it must feel really good to have had that impact on other people's lives. Yeah, because people have had impact on my life. Yeah. So you mentioned you had, you know, been involved in kind of the independent living movement. And I'm wondering um, kind of what your experience with the ADA was. Um, that's been about just 34 years ago that that was passed. And I wondered, you know, how were you involved in that? And how have you seen things change um, since the ADA was passed? Well, the one big one that I was involved with was in 1988 or 89, I was living in the Bay Area, and the buses didn't have lifts, and they were reluctant in wanting to do that. So we had four, 200 people in chairs storm the Moscone Center and for three days or whatever it was. People got arrested. They couldn't get the vehicles so i don't know how they transport them they got ramps or something lifted them in there but they went to jail so we can't light rituals but it was one half of one percent of the bus to make make it accessible so i think that was one of my biggest achievements or memories of changing the way the state looks at people that have disabilities so you know now all the buses have lifts and people can get around and, and so that was one thing that made the paper and and also you know like crip camp it was in that that movie um that the obamas did and then just you know back on the east coast you know rochester uh university of rochester did didn't have a, um, a ramp getting into their buildings. So, you know, we're out there with our protest signs and things like that. So that, and just being a part of um, subcommittees that, like I'm a part of um, in-home support service advisory bid committee to get higher wages. How do you you know, hire more, how do you get more people to be care providers? That's not so much ADA, but that's another aspect of living independently and living a quality of life. So yeah, definitely. I live on my own and I, 
I strive to be as independent as I can be. And and I feel like here I am, like how many years later when I couldn't even move, I couldn't even breathe on my own. And, you know, two years ago, I ended up in the hospital for three months. Right. Because I overworked myself and found myself heart attack, septic blood, um, pneumonia, tracheotomy. You know, I come home using oxygen, you know, and I had to start all over again. Just, mm -hmm. It really made me think about maybe retiring, <laughs> which hasn't happened. <laughs> but, you know, it's been a while ago. Getting there. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, here, look at um, Biden. He's 89. He's still working. <laughs> true. Very true. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, we'll see. You know, I, I've been able to, what's been great is having my board take on more responsibility. Yeah. It's been great. You know, I'm really happy about that. But the ADA, you know, we, I'm always, we're always kind of working and fighting for, not fighting, but working with the city. Like we're working, we just had a meeting yesterday with the city parks and rec mm -hmm. about um, more accessibility on the beaches and in the parks. Um they're gonna they got millions of dollars to renovate the pool. We want to make sure that they have the right equipment, maybe a rolling ramp, and when they finally get more money. Um, so these are all ADA issues and and then there's an interesting news report last night about Uber and Lyft drivers not wanting to accommodate people that have service dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's been a that's been an ongoing oh. issue for quite a while. Oh, I didn't know that. So, yeah. So yeah, all, all the time. So continuously. Well, you are just doing so much of the good work. I'm sure it's hard to <laughs> it's hard yeah. to retire when there's so much work to be done, right? <laughs> right. Well, and what's really cool, I have to tell you another thing that happened just a month ago is a Monterey Bay Sanctuary Foundation, Monterey Bay National Sanctuary Foundation. Um, they, we have an award for you. And I said, what? So they were getting a business, recreation, and tourism award. Wow, so, congratulations. I know. What, what does that mean? It means that I go down to Carmel Valley at Clint Eastwood's Ranch, and hopefully meet him. Uh -oh. And Leon Panetta will be there, and a whole bunch of other big wigs. So, um, yeah, it, you know, I give it, and I give a big thirty-second speech. So I have thirty minutes here, but I have thirty <laughs> there to tell you my whole story. <laughs> Well, what an yeah. honor, though. Now, now you get to say you're an award-winning organization, uh, and I and I actually did a podcast podcast <laughs> with you guys. Yeah. So, where would you like our listeners to connect with you after today's episode? You know, what? How can people learn more about you, the organization, um, and stay in touch? There's so many ways. There's one way is the website sharedadventures.org and that has lots of links to another great page that we've created called the SC Access Guide and that shows you all the accessible parks, resources, social service agencies. Um, so there's that way Facebook. We have a great page there. Um, you can check out our many videos on YouTube. Shared Adventures YouTube and um, Instagram. So, and then our, you know, my phone number is 831-247-7207. How <laughs> many times? <laughs> That's excellent. Um, 
Do you have anything else you'd like to share with our listeners or anything that we didn't ask that we should have as we get close to wrapping up today? Just that you can just follow your dreams and take one day at a time. And if you get depressed and you don't feel like life is worth living, go outside and and just try to enjoy the moment of being alive, I guess. Because life is worth living. Get out there and enjoy the wealth that the world can give. Well, that's great advice. Thank you so much again for your time today, Foster. Yeah. So nice meeting you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Adventures in Accessibility. Tune in next time for another dive into the unknown. Adventures in Accessibility is hosted by Emily Schumann and Jessica Lucinia is our sound engineer. This podcast is a project of the Rocky Mountain ADA Center and is funded under a grant from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. Grant number 90DPAD0014. This production is intended solely for entertainment and informal guidance and should not be considered legal advice. The opinions expressed by guests are not necessarily held or endorsed by the Rocky Mountain ADA Center.